you talk to a friend of yours, a relative, somebody in your town, and you bring up coins, like one out of two people probably light up and tell a story right. about coins. It's a lot right. more common than what people think. Or they'll say, you know, hey, I've got some coins. And, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. Maybe you can tell me what I got. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Kind of funny. Hello, everyone. It's Seth Chandler with Slab Lab. And on today's episode, we have a very good friend of mine. His name is Mark. And Mark, how long have we known each other? Uh, I've probably... 15, 20 years. Yeah, a long time. I know we've had beers together, lunches together yeah. at Long Beach. We've known each other. And I reached out to Mark recently. And I said, Mark, told him all about Slab Lab, what we're trying to accomplish. We've got to get back to the people and the stories behind the coins. And I, you know, you're one of the top collectors that I know in terms of, you know, the kind of coins you collect and what you've learned, your approach to it. And I think that what you have up here in your head is very, very good for a lot of collectors okay. out there. So yeah, so why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I've been collecting since I was eight years old, okay. so that's that's uh, 57 years now. Yeah. Um, started, you know, I had a, a dear aunt that was had the collector gene, mm -hmm. and she had collections of everything under the sun, but mm -hmm. not coins. She mm -hmm. didn't collect coins. Um, had seashells and minerals and antique clocks, and it's just a. It was always a joy to go to her house as yeah. a kid. Was she a little crazy, like a little fun? She was not uh -huh. crazy. She uh -huh. was just the sweetest thing, but she, a... she loved to go to sales and auctions, and she yeah. always bought something. She, she would not leave without buying something. Mm -hmm. So over the years, she picked up an awful lot of really cool stuff. Mm -hmm. so, so one day we were visiting, and she handed me a blue Lincoln Penny Whitman folder mm -hmm. and a three-pound metal can, coffee can of pennies. And I managed to do about 75% of the holes in that one sitting out of wow. that coffee can well, that's fun at eight years old. Yeah. Now, I didn't finish that set until I was about 15 because mm -hmm. I ran, you know, you're not going to pull an 09 SVDB out of a coffee can. Very, sure. very rare that, sure. that happened. But, but in the meantime, while I'm trying to complete those pennies, I, I say, well, okay, I can't find the dates I need. Mm -hmm. um, so I started collecting Indian head cents in the, in, at the same time. So. Yeah. I finished that set, um, didn't upgrade a whole lot because I was very picky about what I put in the set. You know, I wanted a consistent VG to fine grade mm -hmm. because at the time that's all I could afford. Um, but but that got me started, the whole filling thing and the, and the obsession with completing a set. It's amazing, and, that's kind of how we all started, right? It's, yeah. It's, it's the blue Whitman folder, just kind of getting coins from relatives or circulation. It's a great way to start. And, and the thrill of, of filling that hole, you know, it's just, uh, it was very rewarding. And of course, then when you, once you finish the set, it's okay, I gotta go do something yeah, else now because yeah, I'm sure. done with that. But mm -hmm. um, so that was my start. Mm -hmm. um, then I lost interest for about five or six years in the middle there when mm -hmm. I was in my teens. And yeah, teens, or yeah. yeah hit, went yeah. to college and, and that changed. But I got back into it um, in the late 70s and, and just really started approaching it seriously and doing Mercury Dimes and Standing Liberty Quarters. And, so and you've, you've been a serious collector for over 40 years. Oh yeah. 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 Like you, okay. So you, yeah. were you going to A&A shows then? When, when was your I first I started, uh, my first show was actually, uh, I believe it was a GNA show mm -hmm. in, in Georgia in like 1979 wow, in Atlanta. Okay. okay. My first big show. I went to a lot of little shows, but, mm -hmm. but that was my first big show. And there was a big auction there. Um, in fact, I think the, uh, the BB sale was there, mm -hmm. and so I got okay, to go yeah, to an sure. auction and I'm looking at all these great coins at lot viewing and, and the stuff that, you can only dream of owning, owning and never ever be able to buy this stuff. And It changes you, right? The first time you does. see super high-end powerful coins that you've only read about. Right. And also right. you see them in hand and they look so much better in hand, don't they? They sure do. It's like a proof $20 gold coin. Oh, you know, yeah. you read all about it and all of a sudden you see it and it's like, my God. Yeah. yeah it's, it's cool. Of course, and then going mm -hmm. through the Red Book as a kid, you know, you look you look through and, and find all the keys and, and see that the 1849 is minage of one and it's in yeah. the Smithsonian and it's like, holy cow. And later in life, I had an opportunity to go and hold that coin. Sure, and it was yeah. Pretty, mm -hmm. pretty cool. Mm -hmm. That's very cool. cool experience. So then you got started. Okay, so how did it kind of progress in the 80s for you? So you're in your 20s now at this point, and uh, you're working, you're buying coins, you're going to coin shows. You said you were getting involved in Liberty Quarters. Like, what was the next what kind of, what was your first serious coin product? The, the first the first serious project was, I actually started with Mercury Dimes, mm -hmm. which I really liked. And you could, and they, you know, 90% of that set is pretty affordable and sure. high grade. Sure. So, and I started out choice uncirculated because I really liked the look and I mm -hmm. wanted to be 63, 64, or six, sometimes 65. So I did that set. Um, and, and at the time it was interesting because 
at the time I didn't trust my grading enough to mm -hmm. to really you know step out there so so I was very I focused on blast white coins mm -hmm. I, I, if it had toning of any kind I stayed away from it because really? I, I thought geez you know what's underneath yeah, there sure. I, I can't really right. picture what's underneath there so um, I, at the end of the day I ended up with a, a full set of all white mercury dimes which was which was pretty pleasing. How did you store them in an album or just? Yeah, they were in an album. Okay. Yeah, I had them in an album. Uh -huh. um, and then and then I started Standing Liberty Quarters from there. And while I was working on the Standing Liberty Quarter set, I, I just said, you know, these dimes all look the same. Mm -hmm. So I, I got kind of lost interest in that and ended up selling that. And that allowed me to buy my overdate and the key dates in the Standing Liberty Quarters mm -hmm. gotcha. series okay. because that really was an expensive set. And I, I collected a little bit higher quality there right. for oh. those. Um, but then, then my taste changed. You know, you end up with, okay, I don't like tone coins. Now I do like tone coins because so yeah. I'm a little more confident. And I've, mm -hmm. I've gone to a lot of shows and mm -hmm. did a lot of lot viewing and looked at a lot of coins. Mm -hmm. um, but I do remember when third party grading came in, and I'm at a big show. I, I think I'm in. A, that's a fun show. Again, eighty six. Yeah, at the fun show. I, and, I, I was there. Like, I, I was there too as well. Yeah. You know, what is this? Yeah. You know, you saw it oh, in a man. few cases, and it's like it, it wasn't everywhere. Mm -hmm. it, it was just mm -hmm. here and there, mm -hmm. and and it was like wow that. That is an interesting concept because I'd used ANAX for the photo grade before, mm -hmm. and and I thought this is a good idea because mm -hmm. you know I can send in something that I think is really good mm -hmm. and see how my grading compares to the pros. Right. And uh, and I made you know some were right, some were a little a little conservative, and some were a little bit optimistic. Mm -hmm. But um, that kind of taught me how to grade. It was kind of through trial and error. Really. Okay. So I mean, looking back. You know, you always think about pre-grading, you know, PCGS came out in 1986. So you're building some pretty amazing sets in the early 80s of, of BU Mercury Dimes, yeah. you know, uh, BU Standard Liberty Quarters. You look back and go like, wow, that was really kind of crazy to go out there and buy raw coins. They or, were, and, yeah. and I, I, I uh, kicked myself because, you know, both those sets was pretty much gone before grading came in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, because I moved on to bigger and better things, yeah. you know. And, and, and now, you know, every year it was like, God, I can, you know, I can actually afford to buy some of this stuff that sure. I saw in the Red Book that I didn't think yeah. I'd ever hold, much mm -hmm. less own. So mm -hmm. that was pretty cool. Um, but I do regret that because I, some of those coins would probably be really, they're they're in some great collections, I'm sure. Yeah, that's cool. And so they were like, a couple of them were like really unbelievable. Oh yeah, I had, some, I had some incredible coins in that in those sets. Yeah, does really one did. stick out? Um, the overdate was really nice. Uh -huh. um, it wasn't quite a full head, and mm -hmm. you know most of the full head overdates you see are really they, they've got three sprigs, but no real ear sure. holes, so they're not sure. technically full head. But mm -hmm. um, that was a really nice coin. I'm guessing today it's in a gem holder somewhere. Wow, probably so, with a lot of money. You remember what you paid for it back then? I you don't mind. You know, asking? I think it was uh -huh. like maybe thirty seven hundred or somewhere oh, in that range. Wow. It was cheap. Wow, so now that's... Well, now, then it wasn't cheap. That yeah, wasn't cheap. That's a lot of money back then. A yeah. lot of money today, but that yeah. coin's worth a couple hundred grand today, probably. It, probably, and the yeah, last, wow. it was the last hole I filled because it was, uh -huh. you know, it, it took a while to come up with the cash wow. to do that, but... Huh. That's, anyway, that, that's, that, was, that was my journey early on, but um, I, do, I do remember a big moment in my life that changed my life as far as collecting goes is the... Uh, I, I went to New York to the Abe Kossoff sale in 1985, and I'm going through lot viewing and I'm look, I look at these coins and it's like, everything's raw. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a Bowers sale and everything was raw and I'm, I'm looking at a coin and it, it's just, this isn't right. This is a this is a nickel, but it's a three cent nickel mm -hmm. obverse, you know, on a, on a nickel. And a few lots later, there's a, a Liberty nickel obverse on a three cent size mm -hmm. coin. And it's like, this, what is this stuff? Yeah. You know, and someone said, well, you idiot, it's a pattern. You know, <laughs> yeah. that's what they call it, yeah. they're patterns. Yeah. You didn't know about patterns? Mm -hmm. So I walked down to Stacks and, and bought a pattern book and spent mm -hmm. that whole night just going through this. Just, wow, that yeah, these designs huh? are absolutely yeah. amazing. A lot of them, you know, some mm -hmm. of them were pretty pedestrian, but, yeah. but some of them were amazing. And at the time I was doing a Morgan dollar set and I hit these 77 Morgan halves and just went, I gotta, I gotta, own one of these mm -hmm. and I just have to own one of these. Can you explain a little bit to everyone what that is because it's a very popular pattern and it's one of the most gorgeous designs like who yeah, designed it? Yeah, it well it's George Morgan was, mm -hmm. was a designer and mm -hmm. they brought him over from England um, but really the this 1877 half dollars I, I don't know the exact number but there's several different engravers worked on those. Mm -hmm. Both the Barbers, um, Gobrek had a few designs um, and then Morgan but um, 
it was really more or less a, a design competition for the Morgan dollar is yeah, what it turned out. Yeah. I think they were, you know, they hadn't, hadn't made the dollar for a long time. There was a gap there from 73 to 78 and th they were coming up with a new design and they used the, the half dollar size because mm -hmm. that was a circulating, sure. the largest silver denomination yeah. circulating other than the trade dollars. And so it was kind of a competition. And I think there was a lot of friction there among mm -hmm. the, the engravers, the, you know, the designers, but... Um, well, competition breeds excellence. Yeah. You know, more a lot of ego involved, you know? Yeah. So yeah, I mean, you're, you're designing a coin that's gonna circulate widely, yeah. you know, in the United States. So yeah, it's a big And deal. Morgan won out. And the interesting there, thing mm -hmm. there in, in my mind was when, when they brought Morgan in, when Linderman brought Morgan in, he, he knew there was gonna be friction with the barbers and mm -hmm. so, Morgan basically worked out of his apartment. You know, he didn't even have a, a place at the mint. He was he wow. was working out of his apartment uh -huh. to kind of keep them from butting heads. So it, it was an interesting period in, in history. I, I just love, I still love them. Um, you built a set of those, right? I did. And how many were in the set? Well, the set I had, I didn't complete the set. Mm -hmm. I kind of ran into some competition sure. or some, some yeah. deep pocket, it happens, it happens. deep pocket collectors. So mm -hmm. at a point where I could, I just didn't matter what I bid, I couldn't get a coin. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, it, you know, I was pretty much done with the set. So mm -hmm. I, I gave up on it and I did sell it. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of regret selling it, but then it let, that sale actually let me buy a lot of other stuff. So mm -hmm. you can't always look back and yeah. say, gosh, I wish I would have kept that coin, right. or those coins, because you know, now, now you have these coins, <laughs> you know, yeah. a whole lot of things you never thought you'd own, so. It's interesting how, as collectors, when you stick to it and you do the work, you do the grind, you read and research, and how intimately involved you can be in one particular series, yeah. several years later, you, it's in the rear of your mirror and you're on to something else. It's right. amazing how collectors' taste change over time. And it's not just the coins, but it could be like the color, some people like dark tone coins or rainbow toe coins, how you went from white coins and ignored toe coins, now that's kind of the opposite. Yeah, I, so, yeah. I, I actually prefer naturally, yeah. what I think are naturally originally yeah. tone coins. There's some question there sure, you know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. about that. There are differences of, opinions, of opinion, but, um, and, and that's another thing that happened while I was doing these Morgan half dollars and, and trying to do this set, mm -hmm. um, you know, I ran out of, you just can't find them anywhere, yeah. you know, and if you've got a dozen or so, you've got mm -hmm. most of them and now you're, how do you add to that? Well, it was a rare occurrence for, for mm -hmm. one to come up for sale. Yeah. So then I thought, well, I've, I've got to do the dimes and the quarters and the, ha the yeah. 79 halves. They're also the Morgan design. It's, so another, it's a vein, it's another vein that leads yeah. off. That's what's cool. You know, and and, the, and the, the more holes you fill, the mm -hmm. harder it gets to, to, to fill the holes. Yeah. So you, you know, and, and as a collector, an obsessed collector, you've got to scratch that itch all the time. Right. And so I, th that led me to, Continental currency, sure. and, you know, when I when I ran out of this and got as far as I could go and couldn't find anything, I'm not leaving. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. not flying all the way to, to mm -hmm. Orlando and coming mm -hmm. home with nothing. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, start collecting something else. Yeah, and, you know, I'm off in all different directions. It's been mm -hmm. a good experience because I've collected just about everything mm -hmm. over the years. Mm -hmm. so. so it's interesting. You've really, you know, it seems the trend today is to kind of not put so many sets together, but a lot of type sets, a lot of right. just individual gray coins but you're kind of more of a older school collector in the sense that you put a lot of, together a lot of great sets of individual True. series, which I don't think is really being done. Why is that, do you think? It seems to be a little more lost. I, I don't, I have no idea why uh, other people yeah. shied away from that, but yeah. like I'm not, I'm not really focusing so much on sets now. I'm more yeah. of a type collector mm -hmm. because you know, you look at it and you've got, everything's different. Sure. So, and you may like some designs and not like right. other designs, but it doesn't, you don't open it up. Sure. You know, you, when you look at a, a collection of blast white Morgan yeah. dollars and, and it's like, well, they all look the same. Mm -hmm. So yeah. there's not, not a whole lot of things that are interesting about right. that. Now, when you show non-coin people, you have them over for dinner or whatever and mm -hmm. show them something, yeah. um, you show them a typeset and they find it fascinating yeah. because you can, you know, they, there's something in there that they really like for sure because sure, there's enough variety there, but it's also kind of a, it's a timeline of history yeah, and you see sure. the progression, you know, of the, the, the design changes and there's all kinds of historic events that yeah. happen that influence what's going on on the sure, order yeah. of coins and currency. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a, that's a whole nother subject. I mean, you could, it's fascinating. I mean, it's, it's interesting because I've always recommended to collectors, especially newer collectors, there's really two primary ways to collect coins. And that is, you know, buy individual coins that you like, mm -hmm. you know, it kind of leads into a typeset or pick a series and go for it. But I tell people to start out with just buying coins you like in the beginning, and guess what? Over time, you may be attracted to that. 
that really nice Dane Liberty quarter you bought, now you want to do a set. Right. I've always felt that buying, you know, random coins that come from the heart, like, I like that coin, that's a great way to figure out eventually what you want to collect. Because, true. you know, when you build a set and you know there's more than anyone, it's a commitment. It's, yeah. it's, I mean, it's fun, you're climbing Mount Everest, it's a hunt, mm -hmm. there's victories, there's defeats. Yeah. Yeah. So it's very, probably a really big emotional roller coaster depending on the set you want to build. It certainly can be. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. challenging. So. It seems like a lot of advice that I would give to collectors that are building a set is kind of know the end game a little bit, you know, so mm -hmm. kind of do your homework in the beginning, plan, and then commit. You know, no matter what, we're all on budgets. I don't care what your budget right. is, but you spread it over time, it becomes a lot easier, but you have to kind of have a budget because a lot of these coins are going to be challenging. You need to be prepared with the funds. So, That's true. Yeah. And, and there, have been, there have been sets that I've started. And, and you know, you, you, buy, you have a few coins that you really like, buying individual yeah. coins, and you go, okay, this is a great looking coin. And, and I, by the way, I, you know, technical grade's great, but to me, it's all about eye appeal. I feel, I feel Period. Period. Uh, and, you know, yeah, and yeah, it, yeah, it could be an MS63 coin right. or an, an AU58 coin. If it's beautiful, mm -hmm. I'm interested. Mm -hmm. You know, it could be a MS66 coin, and if it's, if it's black, and yeah. you, you know, you can't sure. even tell what the design is. Sure. Technically, it's flawless or close right, to it. Right. I'm not interested. Yeah, so, I hear you. Uh, and, and I think I've had good luck with that because most everybody feels the same way when sure. they see those kind of coins. Sure. So, so it's all about eye appeal. Yeah. But, but you start out buying coins and and you buy just great coins that appeal to you. And now you've got five or six coins, and you and you look at it and go, wow, you know, I've got I've got four. The four of these are gold coins. They're all different. Why not do a type set? You know, and then you start right. down that road. It's that vein. And, it's that vein. Okay, now I got a typeset, but yeah. but you get get into the early gold, and it's like, okay, but I like MS sixty three or better, choice mm -hmm. hunk or better coins. So you get down into that those early dates, and that gets pretty spendy, real very real darn kind of, quick. Yeah. It's expensive and it's challenging. And then you hit a point where you in that set building where you go, I don't think I can ever finish this thing mm -hmm. because I don't think I can get those coins. Yeah. You know, yeah. number one, you can't find them, and when you do, especially now. It, they're hard to afford. They're, they're just pretty darn expensive. So you know, that's another thing. Like I'm 49. I, you know, I'm kind of old, and I can tell oh, you're you, a baby. <laughs> yeah, you know, thank you. But it's just like that's also another harder thing about coin prices. Like for example, you paid thirty seven hundred dollars for the overday quarter. Right now, that coin's one hundred fifty thousand dollars. Right. Even though you've worked harder and you, you know you made more money in your life, you're older. It's still sometimes difficult. To, like wow, I remember when that used to be a whatever a one hundred dollar coin. Now it's eight hundred dollars. It's yeah. harder to to buy it, and right? it's hard to buy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, yeah I had that same mm -hmm. problem with like with the half yeah. Disney. You know, I I can remember when not that long ago they were you know a nice onk was under a hundred grand, yeah. and and now you've seen the fair five hundred thousand fair yeah two sold for ninety some thousand. I don't know what it brought. But that was cool, wasn't it? That, that was, was a neat story. story. That's I a love that story. Good story for coins. It, well, it's a great story, yeah, uh -huh. because it, they're out there. Yeah, you know. So Never for those of you don't, that don't know, it's a seventeen ninety two half dean, really the first coin authorized by Congress. Yeah. A uh, very small coin, but it was how was it? It was just recently discovered, correct? Yeah, I think yeah. it was in a dealer's junk box. Yeah. Uh, the guy bought it for a buck. It was, you know, it was yeah. beat up. I mean, not beat up, but it was well worn. So yeah. it was kind so of hard like to tell what it was, right? It was great. Yeah, was, close to a hundred thousand, wow. or maybe a little more. I don't remember the, the exact numbers, but it was everybody was going. Yeah. That it, there was a build up to the yeah. sale, and, right. and people were talking about it and how great it was and the mm. story behind it. And then yeah. when it finally sold, everyone went, Whoa! <laughs> yeah, that, that was amazing. When you think about the connection that coins have versus the physical object, you think about what that half dean went through. It's made in 1792, right? You know, George Washington giving an address to the Continental Congress talked about the coin, how we had a new production run. You know, they were passed around to everybody, yeah. and so that coin in such a low grade. You know, to a lot of collectors, oh, the condition's not that great, but that coin has been through history. The stories that that particular oh, coin sure. could sell. I mean, sure. no doubt, like George Washington saw the little bag of them or however they were, that, right. that coin was there. Yeah. And it's got all these little hits and scars and things like that, but that's history. Yeah. You know, the coin clearly connects to probably not, probably the most historical American coin, one of them, easily. It has to be, top, yeah. top five. Yeah. You know, and, and you look, I'll look at, like, look at an early $10 gold piece, you know, mm. $17.99, $10, and, yeah. and you look at one in VG and think, mm. man, you know, $10 in 1799 was a lot of money, a lot of money. and yeah. what, all, what, what all did this buy yeah. during its lifetime? 
At the same time, you look at a, a gem, 1799, and think, wow, that was a lot of money. Sure. How did so, how did this survive right. all those years, yes. over 200 years, without yeah. being spent? Yeah, it's crazy. Or, or even uh -huh. worse, mishandled by an heir who didn't know, didn't know what yeah. it was. Yeah. Um, so there's there's an interest on both because I I can appreciate circulated coins. I just I don't collect them now, sure. but I certainly have in the past. And it, it's shocking how some of these coins survived. Like when you really think about it, like we you know we looked at an eighteen hundred five dollar gold coin, PCGS graded AU fifty five. Gold is incredibly soft. It's yeah. ninety percent gold. So what would you say? Maybe six months that coin circulated. So beginning Probably in eighteen hundred. Yeah. yeah. Now we're two hundred twenty years later. The coin circulated for six months. Somebody held on to that coin. Somehow, didn't clean it, didn't polish it. It survived the great melt of uh, 1834, where mm -hmm. a $5 gold coin was worth $5.10 in gold right. value. Yeah. Survived that. You know, and then, I mean, this is all, was also as interesting as, that coin really didn't have value until probably the turn of the century. Right. You know, so in other words, there was no coin shops in 1840 or 1850. Right. Coin dealing, you know, I guess the Kogans in the 1860s, it really started. But that was a very common coin. You know, even uncirculated may get a 50 cent premium back then. Mm -hmm. So really there wasn't a lot of value to the coin to sell it, but people cared for it. People yeah. treasured it. And you know? and again, $5 back in 1800. Yeah. So tempting to spend. You know, how that. did you not how how could they afford not yeah. to spend it? Yeah. You know, that it yeah. that's just a, or put a hole in it, put it around your neck or just right. you just like, wow, it's such rare. That's why it's so expensive. That's why great early coins and 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 really high grade and original condition with eye appeal they sell like Monet's and Van Gogh's. Yeah. They just go through the roof. Yeah. So yeah, there's just not many of them. Yeah, that's cool.